Good morning, Real Life. You guys doing all right? Very good. I pray that you are excited that you are here. If you were here this morning, you're a first-time guest, you go, man, it's really different. And if that's the case, we say thank you for that. But more than that, we say thank you for giving us some of your time. Uh, we know there's about a million things you could be doing on a Sunday morning. Uh, first day, or I guess technically the second day of spring break. Um, hey, here's what, I'm just going to rub it in. If you're here this morning, you watch online later on, and you went on a cruise today and it's pouring rain. <laughs> Uh, got that off my chest. I needed to get that out. So, no, we're excited that you're here. So glad. We're, gonna, we're in our third week of a series called The Go Project. And week one, we talked about the Great Commission, where Jesus tells his disciples as he's leaving this earth, Go, therefore, and make disciples, preaching and teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He gives them a command. And it's called the Great Commission because it is a co-mission. Uh, Jesus has left. He sent the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. But we're a needed part of that mission. God chose to use us, so it is a co-mission. It is not only God's mission, but it's my mission through the power of the Holy Spirit to take his message to the world. Well, last week we talked about your gifts and your talents. Some of you are hyper-gifted and don't use it at all. Some of you are very talented and you haven't stepped into the realm of what God would say is your calling or, or maybe your mission field because you just refuse to use your gifting. And well, I challenge you that as we ramp up towards Easter, there's something that you can do at Real Life Church. We've had a couple of people just in the last few weeks that have stepped up and said, hey, I can come in and do some office work. Let me just tell you what happened. These eggs, now you guys are going to start seeing these eggs, but I have to explain these eggs. These eggs are not for you. We had some people in the first service who was like, hey, go pick up some eggs, egg the city. You guys are going to hear that phrase a lot over the next couple days. We want you to egg the city with these eggs, not yolk-filled eggs, all right? Now, here's what's in the egg so that you understand that they're not for you, all right? Inside is an invitation that says Easter at the Veda Shed Center. On the back is all the pertinent information for Easter at the Veda Shed Center. Then inside, because we are so nice and we love people so much, we give them sugar. There is a piece of candy. Some, it's, it's a variety of candy. There's some Jolly Rancher, Starburst, uh, Tootsie Rolls, all the good stuff. We don't skimp on candy. Praise Jesus. All right? <laughs> But what we had happening in the first service is people came and got their eggs, and as they were walking out the door, started popping them open and eating the candy. These are not for you. They're for your neighbor. They're for the business down the street. I wish I'd have thought about it. I have a picture on my phone. Somebody egged buffalo wow wings this week. Like with these, not the real ones, all right? I know it would have been blasphemy if they had used real eggs. But they, 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 took a, they just set the egg on the side of it, took a picture of it, sent it to me and said, we're egging the city. On our Facebook page, I want you to do just that. Take pictures of you egging your city, put hashtag egg the city on there, and let's tell the whole world what's going on at Real Life Church. Amen? And so I want you to do that. When you leave today, there are eggs in the back. I think we've got 2,000 of those little two-by-two two invitations. I think we have something like 1,500 eggs already filled, and there'll be more to come. So you got eggs to grab and to go take and to drop off in different places. I had some boys come up to me right after service said, hey, we're going to the movies this afternoon. We're going to egg the theater. Absolutely. Egg the theater. Egg your office place. Last year, we almost got a ticket because <laughs> they don't want you to egg the courthouse. They don't like it if you egg the sheriff's department, and they're not big fans if you egg the college campus, because some of our folks went crazy with the eggs two years ago when we did this before. You could pull up to the courthouse, and you know how on a sidewalk, about every four foot, there is a crack in the sidewalk or a seam in the sidewalk? Somebody had went all the way around the square and put an egg every four feet all the way around the courthouse, so you had to pass an egg to go to the courthouse. So Egg the city. If we get a ticket, I'll pay it. But go tell the world what's happening on Easter. Now, here's the bonus. So everybody understands, these are invitations. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. All right. The other thing is that, 
How many of you grew up going to Easter egg hunts? All right. I love Easter egg hunts. I think they're great. Kids love them. My kids love them. But we're not going to do a kid's Easter egg hunt this year. Good. Nobody went, aw. Good. All right. Here's why. Because there are about 15 of them in town. And I don't want to do the same thing everybody else is doing. So here's what we're going to do. Our Easter egg hunt is going to be awesome. All right. Because it's for adults. So here's what we're doing. In an egg similar to this, or one of the other colors, I keep grabbing the pink one, all right? We'll grab the yellow one. But in these eggs, you're, there's a certificate, and there are four of these. We're going to give away a Yeti cooler. We're giving away a Fitbit for all of you whose bits needs to be more fit, all right? <laughs> that didn't work in the first service either when I tried to say that. Um, we're giving away a full day toured fly fishing trip on the white, and we're giving away a weekend getaway. You got to go find the egg. It's a big egg hunt, all right? So over the next several days, at 5.30 every day on our Facebook page, every day, you say, Vince, I don't have Facebook, then steal your neighbor's phone, all right? And figure it out. Like the page, they're atheists. Well, then like the page, maybe they'll meet Jesus, all right? So like the page, you'll get the hints at 5.30 every day that will tell you what the next clue is. There's three clues for each one. The first clues are tough. So good luck, have a lot of fun with it, and go find some stuff, all right? I can't wait to celebrate giving that Yeti cooler to somebody, all right? So go get it. So that's what we're doing for Easter. Be prepared for that. Today, we're in week three of the Go Project. I want to talk with you today about expectations. How many of us believe that God is a good God? Say amen. amen. Yeah. How many of us are so comfortable believing that God is a good God that sometimes we don't expect him to do great things? See, because I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes I'm just good with God being good. I mean, my family's healthy. My kids are healthy. I'm somewhat healthy. Church is growing. People are showing up. It's a good thing. And, and man, God's been good to me. My cars work. The ones that don't work, I got another one, so I don't have to drive the one that does. I mean, I'm, I'm good. God's been good to me. But the reality is that God doesn't just deal in good. God actually specializes in awesome and great and amazing and overachieving. That's kind of the God we serve. Because it, you can read in Scripture where Jesus doesn't just allow Moses and the Israelites to kind of skirt the issue of the Red Sea. He says, no, no, no. Watch this. And he parts the sea for them to pass through on dry ground. Because God's not just a good God, he's a great God. And I think when we go into our life, when we go into our day-to-day -day activities, I pray that you haven't got to the place that I have sometimes got to where it's just, yeah, God's good all the time and all the time God is good. And we can rattle that off and we forget that God is wanting to do something amazing in you. He wants to do something in you that is going to make the world look at you and go, where did that come from? I don't understand where this comes from. So I want to look today at two different towns in the scripture. And the first town we're going to look at is Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is a pretty interesting place because that's where Jesus grew up. It's where Mary and Joseph lived after they came back from Egypt, after Jesus was born. And so they're living in Nazareth. That's why they called Jesus the Nazarene. He was from Nazareth. And so we had Jesus there. So this is his hometown. Now, I'm going to give you a little backstory before I show you the scripture. Jesus had gone in in Matthew chapter 13, and he's teaching. Man, he dropped some great stuff that day. I mean, he's ripping off the parable of the sower and the seed and the lost coin and the lost sheep. And people are going, man, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's really got something interesting. And he's teaching at the synagogue and people are listening. And then in the last verse, or the second to last verse, we have somebody pipe up in the corner that goes, well, I know that all sounds good, but that's it's just Mary and Joseph's kid. He's just a carpenter's son. So really, what stock can you put in what he's saying? Y'all ever have anybody like that in your life that just remembers everything you used to be and never what you could be? Yeah, see, it's a lack of expectations. Or the wrong expectations. They just expect you to follow the same cycle rather than serving a God who can change everything in you. 
And so what happens is we see these people, and Jesus is dealing with these people in his hometown. They watched him grow up. They seen him sanding the chairs with Joseph. They seen him walking back and forth to school. They know his brothers and his sisters, and, 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 and they, they know him. So, you know, this, he's smart, but it's just Joseph's kid. But then this is what happens. I want you to listen to this verse. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, this is what it says. And so he did only a few miracles there because of what? Yeah. Whose unbelief? Yeah. Theirs. You need to catch that because in a second I'm going to show you another town where it's the same wording but something very different happens. You say, well, Jesus, you're saying Jesus couldn't do the miracles because of their unbelief? No, it doesn't say that. It says that he didn't do the miracles because of their unbelief. Because I'm going to just be honest with you. If you're going to go to something, and let me just, I'm trying to think of a good way to, to illustrate this. If I'm going to go play in a game, all right, well, like I have kids, Braden has a dirt bike. Now, Braden really only knows one way to ride his dirt bike, and that's wide open. He, he doesn't really like to putt around the yard. I'll say, hey, you need to just kind of cruise on a little bit, let the engine warm up. Okay, Wah! he's screaming through the yard, throwing mud and dirt everywhere. He only knows full blast. And I appreciate that about him. But if I show up to do something in life, I want to show up to do something in life. I, I don't want to just kind of halfway do it. And I think that Jesus kind of expects the same from us. That if we're going to show up as believers in Christ, I think he's kind of screaming down from heaven. Show up. Don't just ride the fence. Don't just kind of go, hey, God, I did the Sunday morning thing. We're good. No, 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 no. I want you to show up. I want you to live this thing. I want you to breathe this thing. I want, I want you to be engaged in this thing. And so when Jesus saw that they weren't engaged in it, they said, nah, we know who you are. It's not that big a deal. He said, fine. If you're not going to show up, why should I? But so then we have Nazareth, and then you shift over to another town. And this is where our main text is going to be. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Because in Mark chapter 2, we run into another little town. That's called Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is where Jesus had moved just before he started his ministry here on earth. So Jesus moves to Capernaum, and he starts ministry, and then we get this passage when he comes back. Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 1, it says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon, the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. Now, see the difference there? What happens when there is expectation for something to happen and when there's expectation for nothing to happen? Because the reality is, I believe that God wants to do great things through real life church. I believe that he wants to do great things through you individually. But if you wake up without any expectation whatsoever of him doing great things, don't count on them. Don't count on them. I knew sports growing up, and I can remember going in, and I've helped coach at times. I'm just going to tell you, if you're a baseball player, and you're a hitter, and you step up to the box, and you're ready to hit, and you get in there with the idea that I'm going to hit, your chances are much better. If you get up there and you go, I'm probably going to strike out again. I'm probably going to strike out again. I hope he doesn't throw it. Maybe he'll just hit me. Maybe that, that would be much easier. I'll just lean a little bit. I'll crowd the plate. Maybe he'll hit me. That'll be good. If that's your attitude going into it, don't expect great things. One of Babe Ruth's most famous quotes was, never let the fear of striking out keep you from swinging. We don't know Babe Ruth because of his strikeouts. Now, he had a bunch, but that's not why we know him. Some of you are like, I know a candy bar, but there used to be a baseball player named Babe Ruth. And, and, and so he just got up and swung. Well, what if you strike out? Then I'll swing again in a minute. We don't do this with anything else, really, but God. Because you didn't get up this morning and go, I think I'm going to have a horrible day. Pretty sure the kids are going to be demons. Pretty sure my job, I may get fired today, and I'm just going to go through it. If you got up this morning like that, do the world a favor, go back to bed. Because you are tough to be around. You, and you know what I'm talking about. Those attitudes of people that are just sour because of this is how I got up feeling, so this is what I'm going to do. And some of you take it a step further. You may have got up in a good mood, 
But the first thing that happened was a bad thing, and so the rest of the day is a train wreck because of that one bad thing. Any of those people in the house say amen? amen. Any of you sitting next to them say amen? amen? Yeah. You'll stub your toe, and it's like, I hate the world because you stubbed your toe. <laughs> I got a little conviction right here on the front row. You okay? Do we need to pray right now? We can shut her down right now if we need to. Because we do that. Our expectation, well, it didn't go like I wanted it. Well, here's the great thing about expectations when it deals with God and our spirituality. If you will lay your expectations on the altar of God and say, God, whatever you want to happen, I'm down for it. Let's see it. Let's, let's go. Let's see what happens. Then I promise you, you're going to be amazed. We're doing Easter to Shed in a few weeks, and I'm super excited about it. But right now, for our response team, you say, what's a response team? At the end of that service, I'm going to tell people how to meet Jesus Christ. Some of them for the first time. Some of them may be coming back to him. But right now, I already have 12 people that I've said, I want you to be ready to grab anybody that steps up or stands up and says, I want to meet Jesus, because we don't want to miss the opportunity. I'm expecting people that day to meet Jesus. And so I know this expectation is there. That's what Jesus is dealing with in Capernaum, but he didn't get in Nazareth. They were ready. They were amped. Let's do something. Jesus is back home. Let's show up. Well, it's going to be a little crowded. Yeah, let's show up. They filled the house, even to the outside. We're going to go ahead and jump down and read here some more. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing, seeing whose faith? What's that say? Well, maybe it's not on there. Go to the next verse. <laughs> Got to stay with me, guys. Stay with me. All right, thanks. All right. <laughs> seeing whose faith? Their faith. Their faith. You see what happened in the two cities? Because of their faith, he didn't do a lot of miracles. Because of these guys' faith, he's about to rattle the walls in the place. He says, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven you. He goes on and he says, but some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Now, I love what scripture does. I'm going to leave this right here. That first sentence says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. He's running through the thoughts and the doubts and the things in their head. Let me give you the enemy of positive expectations. It's doubt. It's doubt. Well, I don't want to tell them about Jesus because they're going to get mad because I don't even think they like church. As soon as you doubt, the devil goes, check, check. <laughs> You're not going to Easter service. I know that's not happening because they're too afraid to ask you. Here's the thing. Here's the reality of what could happen if you ask someone to church. They could say no. Most of you have never been punched in the mouth because you asked someone to church. Am I right? Anybody drop kicked, headlocked, scissor kicked, anything like that because you said, hey, you want to go to church with me? None of that has ever happened here. You've not experienced that. Now, other countries, other places, yeah, they walk in that kind of danger. We don't. Our doubt doesn't stem from danger. Our doubt stems because we stop expecting God to be great and have just got comfortable with him being good. God's good for me. God's good enough for me and to me and through me. The thing is, if we'd believe he was great, then he'd be great enough for our friends and their friends and their family and their kids and their parents' kids and all of them. we got to start believing that he's great. Jesus saw this. He said, is it easier for you or for me to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? I love when Jesus does this kind of stuff in the Bible. Or stand up, pick up your mat and walk. So he calls them out on what they're thinking. You guys are sitting there griping and moaning because I said this guy's sins were forgiven because of their faith. He said, but if you want to play that game, let me just show you how amazing I am. And now he wasn't doing it out of arrogance. It was to make sure they understood the glory of God and the power that he held. It wasn't, hey, look at me. It was their faith has stepped up. They have leveled up in their faith, and I'm about to reward them for that leveling up. So here's some things that an expectation will bring, and we're going to finish this verse in just a second. The first expectation is this. An expectation will lead to an invitation. Expectation will always lead to invitation. Let me just throw it out there like this. It's a little different. 
If there's an expectation in your heart, there will always be an invitation on your lips. So here's the thing. If you're not telling people about church and Easter, you're probably not expecting much to happen when you get here. Because stuff that we expect, we tell people about. When, when, ladies, how many of you give birth to a child or have a child? So when you were expecting that child, you made it known. You told people. Now, I never had the honor or privilege and I'm just going to say it like that, of delivering a baby. <laughs> I was trying to be respectful because I don't want no part of that. Um, but the expectation of having one on its way, I got to be a part of that. And I told everybody because I was going to have a baby. I mean, I wasn't, but my wife was, and I got to be a part of it. I was going to be in the room. I was holding the video camera, smiling the whole time. I was just grinning at Jennifer. She's like, stop smiling. And I'm like, I'm, okay. I'm sorry, I won't smile. But I couldn't help smiling because we were about to have a baby. And then when Vanessa came and then Kaylee came, I was smiling because we were about to have a baby. And when Kaylee came and then Braden came, I was smiling because we were, I'm telling everybody. Walk through the halls in the hospital. Hey, Pastor Vince, why are you here? Having a baby. It's a boy. It's a girl. It's going to be awesome. They're going to change the world. They're going to land on the moon and then come back and run for president. And while they're running for president, they're going to heal cancer. <laughs> That's what my kids are going to do. What are yours doing? <laughs> Playing t-ball? Oh. <laughs> well... No, because we expect none of you when your child was born with, honey, I can't wait. You know what? They're going to be so average. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're going to stay D plus, C minus the whole time they're alive. <laughs> Aren't you excited? You didn't do that. And if you did, shame on you. I wouldn't want to be your kid. We expect great things from them. The first time my kid grabbed a baseball bat, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a millionaire because of my kid. <laughs> my daughter, Kaylee, runs, and she, she runs distance. I don't run as much as I used to. And, and so last year, I'm like, hey, let's go run. She's like, okay. And she ran, and I walked a lot. <laughs> I'm like, I'll catch you on the way back. Because when she ran, runs, I'm thinking, I'm going to the Olympics. Because my expectations, my anticipation of what they could be is always through the roof. God, we want you to show up. Yeah, I know, but I don't know if my friends are going to come. I, you know, they, they probably wouldn't even like church because they don't really like loud noises. And we're kind of loud. And sometimes, Vince, you scream real loud right out of nowhere, and it shocks me. And, and they may not like that. If you're doubting before you get in the game, if there is no expectation in your heart, there will not be an invitation on your lips. So if your friends and family don't show up, don't blame anybody else. Okay? And you say, well, that was, geez, Vince. Kind of gut punched me right there. Sometimes we need to realize the importance of what it is that we do. And we have the message of Jesus Christ. And here's how passionate I am about the message. I'm not convinced that if I don't tell the world, somebody else will. That's my job. It's your job. Now, you may not tell the whole world, but we better tell our world. I, I don't have a lot of friends that don't go to church, so I talk to random people. It's going to be awkward when I walk up to somebody in Walmart and go, Hey, you want an egg? <laughs> but I'm just goofy enough to try it. The eggs aren't the only invitations we have. We have cards. Here's the thing. Here's the invitation part I want you to be begin playing with in your mind right now. I want you to get five names in your head. Five. Now, if you know a family of five, don't cheat. <laughs> Susie, Jenny. No, don't do that. Get five names in your head. And I'm going to begin praying that God keep you awake with those names until they show up to church. It's like it got real quiet. You're like, Vince, you messed me up my sleep now. <laughs> I love church and stuff, but now listen. The invitation is so crucial. Because, see, I don't know your world. If I walk into your world and invite them, they may go, I don't even know you. If you walk into that world and invite, they'll say yes just because it's you. Just because it's you, they will. 
So ask. The invitation has to be there. Second thing is this, is expectation leads to preparation. I love these four guys that carry this mat. They hear Jesus is in town. They say, you know what? Jesus is in town. Jesus is, yeah, it's Jesus. We need to get, we don't ever hear the guy's name. It's just a paralyzed man on a mat. We're going to call him Frank, all right? I don't think that's a biblical name, but you're with me. So we got to get Frank to Jesus. Why do we got to get Frank to Jesus? Because he's going to stay on the mat if we don't get him to Jesus. Well, how are we going to get there? Well, I can't carry him. I can't carry him either. What are we going to do? We're going to prepare. We're going to find two more people that are going to see Jesus. We're going to get him on a mat. We're going to carry him over there to see Jesus. And they prepared to get there. They prepared to see Jesus. They prepared in advance to receive something later on. I want to ask you, how many of you are preparing before you come to church to receive something? I know a few of you do, and some, most all of you may. You may come expecting God to do something awesome, or are you coming, to ex- are you coming with the expectation, with, maybe Vince will make me laugh this week. I hope I do. I hope you bust a gut. I hope you wet yourself right there in your chair laughing. No, I don't do that. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you the why. And some of you are going to think I'm manipulating when I tell you this, but that's all right. I, my goal is to be authentic with you. The reason I use humor is because typically come to pe- people come to church with a wall right here, especially if they come the first time. It's a wall. And they're walking in like this. You can try, but you're not going to get much. And here's what I try to do. I try to speak with you and to you just like I'd speak to you and with you if we were standing in the parking lot. I'm just, I'm this animated Tuesdays at the office. I don't, I don't do it up here. That would be weird. <laughs> but I, I love to talk with people. And so if I'm funny here, it's because that's just my personality out there. And I know one thing, that if I can get you to do one of two things, if I can get you to laugh, this thing that's right here suddenly drops to here. If I can get you to laugh again, it drops to here. And if maybe you feel some emotion that it's been a while since you felt, you finally let it go. And then you begin to hear the voice of God. And that's my desire. That's why I use humor. That's why I love to have fun at church because I think so long people have come with an expectation that we're going to sit there for 90 minutes and be bored out of our skull. I hope you sit here for 60 minutes and have a blast the time of your life, because I serve a Jesus that changes everything. The stuff in your life, the past that you had, have an expectation that God's not going to just fix it. He's going to change it. He's going to recreate it. And so that's what I want for you in your life. And so you say, well, Vince, we just laugh and have a good time. Great. But know the purpose behind it. It's so that you maybe one day will look past the laughter and hear the voice of God saying, he's talking to you. Some of you have already come to me and said, Vince, you must be reading my mail. I don't know how you know all that stuff in my life. I don't know the stuff in your life. I just come expecting God to already be dealing in your life. So this expectation takes preparation. These guys carry the mat there. They get there, and it's bad news. The place is packed. It leads us to our third and final point. Here's the thing. An expectation doesn't only lead to an invitation. It doesn't only lead to preparation, but expectation better lead to urgency. Now, if you're a parent, you understand urgency. I have two little boys, and when we go on trips, I'm not a big fan of the bathroom break. I like to just drive. And if you have to go to the bathroom, I'm going to tell you, hang on, wait, hold it. Now, I'll be nice. Hold it, please. <laughs> and I'll say things like, all right, the next exit will stop. And I'll pass the exit. I'm sorry, I missed that one. We'll get it at the next exit. And then I'll pass that one. I get, usually, I can squeeze about four exits out before I actually have to stop. But there comes a point in the young boy's life, or anybody's life for that matter, that you reach a point in the urgency that there's nothing else you can do. You got two options. You're either going to stop and pee on the side of the highway and pray a semi doesn't drive by, or it's going to be in the floorboard. Amen? Could, you guys know what I'm talking about? If you've got kids, it's not like, hey, I've got to go to the bathroom in 10 minutes. It's like, hey, we got to do this thing now. 
I got to go now. Well, no, can you hold it? Huh? Well, can you just give me a second? I ain't got a second. We got to stop the car now. You guys know what I'm saying? See? I've been there before. Right on the highway, you hit the rumbles. Gosh, now everybody's awake that was asleep. And you let him go because the urgency's there. This urgency was there. And I love the urgency of these four guys. They get to the house. Let's keep reading what it says. They, they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they went. Maybe next Sunday. We'll come back. Maybe, maybe, maybe next, we'll get him next Sunday. Jesus, we'll see you when you come back through. Nope. Some dude on one of the corners went, I got an idea. What do you want to do? You guys cover for me. <laughs> and I don't know how they got a paralyzed body on the roof. I, if you don't know who MacGyver is, I'm pretty sure one of his ancestors was carrying one of the corners of the bed. <laughs> and they got him up on the roof, and they looked at this guy's house. It doesn't say this was any of their house. These are four guys with a paralyzed guy, showed up at a stranger's house to see Jesus, and decided... We're tearing the roof off this mug. Let's get it done. We got to get it done. Why do we got to get it done? Because he needs Jesus. But there's a ton of people. No, 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 you're not listening to me, guys. He needs Jesus. But they're going to get mad. We're going to tear the roof off. Then what? We'll deal with that when the roof gets torn off. But right now, he needs Jesus. There's an urgency that builds when we understand what God wants to do. And if you're not urgent about this mission that God has given us, then we're missing it. What are you urgent about? Well, i got to go to work tomorrow. If, if that's it, man, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I don't know what else to say other than that. I'm sorry. That's all the urgency in your life is about making it to work on time. When your friends and some of your family don't know Jesus. I oftentimes wonder why our urgency isn't more. Why, why we don't go get it. And I tell you why. It's because we've grown comfortable with what God can do for us rather than what God can do through us. That's why the invitation isn't on our lips, is because that's for me. Church is my time. No. No. I don't do this because I love the exercise I get. I do this so that you come and you hear the message of God. I, I do this so that even though you might not be able to witness to your friend or, or invite them to church, you, you may not be able to tell them the story of Jesus, but I can. So I do this so you've got a place to bring them. I, I do this so that one more person might meet this Jesus that I know and I love. And let me just tell you a story real briefly about the urgency that's needed. And I'll close with this. We were pastoring in Batesville, and, and we had a homeless guy pulls up to the church. He had a vehicle, but he didn't have a house. I'm in the church, and I'm working there at the church, and he comes in. He says, is anybody here? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm right up here. What can I do for you? He said, I'm, I'm starving. I'm really hungry. I just got out of the hospital. They told me I had to leave, but I don't have any place to go, and I'm hungry. And I said, man, it's just me here today. I don't, I don't, have, anything, I don't have anything for you. I said, but, but there's a sister church. It's another church right down the street. And they have a kitchen and everything. I'm sure that they'd love to feed you. He said, okay. So he left, and I went back to work. Figured I'd never see him again. About an hour later, he pulled back in. He said, pastor, can I, can I stay here? And I said, I don't understand what you mean. He said, well, I sleep in my Jeep, but I have an oxygen concentrator in the back because I can't breathe real well, and so I need a place to plug it in, and I feel safe here. I said, sure, you can do that, but it's Saturday. I said, we start church in the morning at 10 o'clock, so you need to make sure that 
you're out of the way so that people can come in. And he said, yeah, I'll be out of the way, no problem. I said, but sure, you're welcome to come back. So he came back and parked there that night. Next day we had church. He didn't show up for the Sunday morning service. He didn't show up. He did show up for the Sunday evening service, sat in the back. We left, took off after Sunday night church like good Baptists do, and we went to Dairy Queen. Yeah, buddy. Got some of that soft serve, peanut buster parfait, stuffed our faces. We drive back, and we had to pass the church to get to our house where we lived, and we've got the kids loaded in the back. At that time, it was just Vanessa and, and Kaylee and Braden. And we're driving back, and Vanessa leans up between the seats, a little curly head and grinning. And she said, man. I said, what, babe? I bet that guy's hungry. I said, yeah, he he probably is. So we pulled into the church and Jennifer made him a basket. We've had some food there and we took him into the church. I said, Don, I said, uh, I don't know you, but we have, a, we have a, an apartment set up in the church for people that do uh, revivals and stuff. And man, you're welcome to stay in here. About that time, Vanessa shot out the door and she, I figured she was just playing in one of the other church rooms while I was talking with him. And uh, he said, I can't sleep in here. And I said, no, really, it's okay. He said, no, physically, I can't lie down. I have COPD. If I lay down, I'll choke myself to death. I have to, I've got really good at sleeping in my truck. It's really okay, Pastor. It's okay. About that time, Vanessa walks back in the door, and she hands him this scribbled-on card. You open this card up, and there's a big heart in the middle of it. And across the top of it, it says, Jesus loves you. And then down at the bottom of it said, and so do I. And Don grabbed that from her and he folded it up and he thanked her for that. He said, she's really cute. I said, she really knows it. <laughs> so Don stayed in our parking lot for a couple weeks. We got into the month of February as we got into the month of February, Don started coming more on Sunday nights. We'd found him a job at, a, at Walmart. They let him be a greeter in one of the powered wheelchairs. And so we'd found him a job and got him working. We'd come to church. And one Sunday night, we're sitting there in service, and I'd preached about the grace of God. And my daughter walked out of the row in the back. Vanessa stepped out, and she came forward at seven years old. And that night, she gave Jesus Christ her life. And I remember, and it was so great for me to see Vanessa take that step as a dad, as a pastor. But then as she got about halfway down the aisle, I heard that oxygen tank rattle. And Don got up. And he walked down, and he sat down on the front row because he couldn't kneel. And he said, Vince, whatever she's getting. And he pointed at her. He said, whatever that little girl has got, I need it in my life. I need it because I don't know how to do this alone, and I can't understand why you would love me or why she would love me, but I need whatever it is. And he accepted Christ that night, not because of the urgency in my heart, because I, I told him to go down the street. I told him another church would help him. And now I see that God brought him back, not so that I could minister to him, but so that my seven-year-old would. We celebrated that night. Don got saved. Vanessa accepted Christ. It was a great night. I was cloud nine, buddy. Tuesday morning, I come to the office. I walked in, Jennifer and Braden were with me. I said, you guys go on in, I'm going to say hey to Don. And I walked up to Don's truck, and in the night, he'd passed away. Two days after he accepted Christ. You and I will never know the need for urgency. You and I don't know what's on the other side of today. But I know what's happening today. What's happening today 
is that somebody somewhere needs Jesus and I have the message. Somewhere somebody needs Jesus and you have the message. And you've got to have this urgency. Here's what the scripture says in John. It says this, we must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. Jesus has sent us. The night is coming where soon no one will do any work. There must be an urgency in what we do. I want you to bow with me. I want you to begin praying. Christian, if you're here right now, if you're a believer, I want you to begin praying, God, make me urgent. God, make me, make me serious about serving you, about telling the world about you, about the invitation in my heart and on my lips, about preparing my heart to hear what you would have to say. But God, make me urgent. There's a scripture in Jeremiah. It's one of my favorites. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a prophet. They call him the weeping prophet. And he goes to an area and he begins to tell them what God has said and they don't listen. He gets frustrated. God, they're not listening to me. I'm not going to say another word because it doesn't matter. When I talk about you, they just shrug. Their, they don't listen, so I'm done. I'm not saying anything. And then it's just moments later, we read this passage where Jeremiah says, Oh God, these words, they're in my bones like a fire that I cannot contain. My bones feel like they're on, God, I've got to tell somebody, I've got to tell anybody about what you've done in my life, that my family's healthy, that my marriage is strong, that my job is great, that my church is wonderful, and that my Jesus is amazing. I've got to tell somebody with this spirit thing that you have given me. I've got to share this message with the world. I pray that that urgency falls on you. Some of you have mission fields larger than you can imagine. Bigger than you know. And I pray God's urgency speak to you. If you're here this morning, no one looking around, I'm just going to ask this one time. If you're here this morning and you would like to know that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that you would like to know that Jesus Christ has forgiven you of all of your sin, and cleansed you from everything that you were. And you haven't done that yet. Would you just lift your hand and put it right back down? Just lift it up and put it right back down. Church, I want to pray for you. And then I'm done. Father, Ignite within us a passion and an urgency for our world. An urgency that won't let us stop with a no. Lord, that we get them here whatever we have to do. It's that important. It's that valuable. Their life matters that much. If not to us, God, it does to you. And that matters to me. And so, Father, I ask again that your hand would be upon us, that you would give us passion, you would give us a sense of urgency in our heart. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.